Hello, good afternoon everyone. Um, I do have quite a few items at the top, so if you'll just bear with me and then I'd be happy to jump in and start taking your questions. So earlier this week, as, as you may have seen, Secretary Austin gave opening remarks yesterday at the Ukraine Defense Industrial Base Conference held here in Washington, DC. The conference connected relevant US and Ukrainian industry and government representatives to discuss initiatives that could enhance Ukraine's defense industrial base and, built on, and build on momentum generated by a successful event Ukraine hosted in Kyiv in September 2023, all of which signals strong US support for enhanced industry partnership. As part of the conference, Dr. Bill LaPlante, Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, convened the eighth meeting of the National Armament Directors uh, under the auspices of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group today. The meeting is being held here at the Pentagon, the first time the forum has convened here in the United States. This meeting brings together more than 40 nations, NATO and the European Union, to engage on industrial base and sustainment challenges in support of Ukraine, both for their immediate requirements while also supporting Ukraine's long-term defense and national security needs. Later in, that, in the day, Secretary Austin hosted Ukrainian Minister of Defense Umaro Umerov for a bilateral meeting. Secretary Austin highlighted the department's ongoing activities to meet Ukraine's urgent requirements, including the announcement of the 52nd tranche of security assistance from DOD inventories for Ukraine. The package included additional air defense capabilities, artillery ammunition, anti-tank weapons, and other equipment to help Ukraine counter Russia's ongoing war of aggression. This package utilized assistance previously authorized for Ukraine during prior fiscal years under the Presidential Drawdown Authority, but it is critical, as you all know, that Congress pass the President's National Security Supplemental Request to ensure we can continue to support Ukraine. Security assistance for Ukraine is a smart investment in our national security because it helps prevent a larger war in Europe while strengthening our defense industrial base and creating skilled jobs back home here for the American people. And without additional funding, the department may soon reach a point where it can't sustain the current level of security assistance support to Ukraine. Also yesterday, the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, in coordination with the department's V-22 Joint Program Office, announced an operational stand-down for all Osprey variants in the wake of the November 29th CV-22 mishap off the coast of Japan. This action is being taken out of abundance of caution while the AFSOC investigation is conducted. As each service conducts operational safety reviews within their fleets, each will reevaluate their respective grounding bulletins and then determine timelines for resuming flight operations in close coordination with the Joint Program Office. We'd also like to thank the Government of Japan for all their assistance in the search and recovery efforts throughout this incident, and we will continue to work with them on sharing information and safety procedures during the investigation. Of course, our thoughts remain with the families of those airmen who were lost. Air Force Special Operations Command is investigating the CV-22 mishap, and I'd refer you to them for any additional questions. Switching gears to Congress, earlier this week, the Senate confirmed over 420 of our highly qualified general and flag officers. These holds have dragged on for months, degraded our military readiness, and forced far too many of our military families to put their lives on hold and endure even greater sacrifices. And while this was welcome news, we still have dozens of officers that still have had holds placed on them, some of whom are four stars. We urge the Senate to confirm the remainder of our qualified military leaders as soon as possible so that we can have our team in place to meet this critical moment for our national security. And shifting gears again, uh, next week, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks will visit locations in Silicon Valley, California. She will visit the Defense Innovation Unit, where she will meet with DIU personnel who are accelerating the U.S. military's adoption of commercial technology to strengthen national security, and she will also receive an update on DIU projects through a series of capabilities demonstrations. She will also meet with a wide range of industry leaders to discuss the department's rec replicator initiative, discuss innovation across the department, and see demonstrations of AI-powered autonomous technologies. And just one more item. Earlier today, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin called His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Salman, Saudi Minister, Saudi Minister of Defense, to discuss Houthi threats to freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. We will have a readout coming shortly if you don't already have it in your inbox. And with that, I'd be happy to open up to some questions.
Tar, do you want to start us off? Hi, Sabrina. Um, first on the Osprey, yeah. you know, the Osprey makes up a sizable portion of the Marine Corps fleet, air fleet. How is Marine Corps and Air Force and Navy going to mitigate the loss of uh, access to this aircraft while this investigation is going on? Well, because it's something that they are instituting in terms of the stand down, I'd really uh, refer you to them to speak to um, how they are managing this um, this stand down and how th it's um, impacting or not their own operations. So I'd refer you to them to speak to that. But is the secretary concerned about a loss of this many aircraft at once with so many things going on? The secretary fully supports the services and they're um, out of you know the abundance of caution to, to stand these, these fleet, these aircraft down. This is something that we've done before. Um, whenever there is a mishap that um, a service feels needs um, either more investigation or just out of an abundance of caution, um, there have been stand downs of, the, of fleets before of other platforms. And so the secretary, of course, supports the service's decision to do that. Um, and again, I'd refer you to the services regarding their, their details on the pause of operations. And then uh, last, mm -hmm. the, the Pentagon for more than a year has been trying to stand up a flight safety office where all of this data is supposed to go to be able to look across services, see trends. What's the status of that office and is it looking to this incident? I don't have a status update on the office, but as I mentioned um, in the beginning, we do have the joint program office for this platform that is coordinating with the services and other customers who use the Osprey. Um, so that is something that is, you know, a connecting um, office that is coordinating across the services and to our allies and partners. But I don't have an update for you on that particular office at this time. It's supposed to be a deputy secretary of defense level mm -hmm. to really elevate flight safety. And when concerns are raised by maintainers or units, elevate them to a point where you get a very high level of visibility but it's been more than a year since the office was supposed to be up and running. Yeah. yeah, so again, I would say that, as you know, the secretary takes safety and security as one of his top priorities. Um, we are, the, the services are out of an abundance of caution. Um, again, putting a pause on this platform I don't have an update for you on that particular office, but it's not to say that safety and security of our service members is not a concern. Um, that's exactly why you're seeing um, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force do what they are doing. Um, but I'd refer you to them to speak to, to more details on that. Yeah, thanks. Laura. Yeah, um, can you please give us an update on the attacks in Iraq and Syria? How many, how many have we had? How many injuries have there been altogether? And um, have there been any more incidents in the Red Sea since yesterday? Um, so in terms of any other additional instances or attacks since yesterday, I'm not tracking anything that's occurred in the Red Sea or at any of our bases. Um, I believe I believe as of uh, today, there have been approximately 78 attacks on our, on our bases, but I don't have anything that's happened within the last 24 hours. Does the department assess that there's been a slowdown in the attacks in the last couple days, a week or so? Well, I mean, and I feel like I was asked this question a few weeks ago when there was, you know, an uptick in attacks, and yet we do have a like a day or two that will go without any attacks. So it's really hard to say. I would um, direct you to the forces, the these hostile militant groups that continue to attack our 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 coalition forces and our troops in Iraq and Syria on why they are, you know, doing what they're doing and when they decide to do it. But in the last 24 hours, we haven't seen any attacks on our forces. Um, should that change, of course, we would let you know. But um, that's the latest that I have as of right now when I'm standing up here. And just on the injuries, sure. the number of injuries. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as of December, as of, I would say, December 4th, um, it's still about 66 of our folks um, who have received non-serious, non-life-threatening injuries, all who have returned to work. Um, I know you'll probably ask about TBIs, but I just don't have an update for you on that at this time. Thank you. Janie. Uh, the United States uh, indicted for four Russians for war crimes. Is this just because they studied uh, war in Ukraine? Yeah, that's something that I saw the Department of Justice announce yesterday. I'd direct you to them for more information. Have we any name over those people? I don't. It yeah. was uh, Putin included this? Again, I would direct you to the Department of Justice who launched um, or who announced that um, yesterday. I just don't have more information on those on those names.
one more? Quick. Sure. Okay. Uh, the United States Space Force Command announced that the possibility of destroying North Korea's military satellite. And uh, when do you think that time will be coming? I'm sorry, I've not seen that report, but I don't have anything for you on that. I'm going to go to the phones here. Idris, Reuters. Hey, Sabrina. There have been a number of uh, reports in the past uh, couple of hours about the killing of uh, the Reuters journalist, Assam Abdullah, and injuring of other journalists in Lebanon uh, in October. And one of the stories from Reuters says definitively that an Israeli tank um, was responsible for firing two shells um, that killed uh, Assam. Does the DOD have an independent assessment of what happened that day? Um, secondly, do you have you talked to the Israelis about the killing? And thirdly, do you believe Israel kills journalists as a matter of policy? Uh, thanks, Idris. Um, so in terms of an independent assessment, I just don't have that for you um, uh, at this time. I have seen the reports out there, but there's that's not something that um, we've been able to assess independently here in the building. Um, again, I think you've seen with all of our readouts that the secretary has had with Minister Gallant, um, with other senior leader engagements from across this administration, we continue to urge Israel um, to conduct its operations in a targeted manner um, as it is seeking out a and and addressing a um, a brutal terrorist organization within Gaza. Um, we continue to urge Israel to uphold the laws of armed conflict and humanitarian law and the protection of innocent civilians, which includes members of the press. Um, and so that's something that has come up uh, that we've talked about publicly. It has come up privately as well. And um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Constantine, Military Times. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. Um, I wanted to, going back to the Osprey, in August, you said that the department has confidence in the Osprey as a platform. Uh, given everything that's come out this past week, is that still true? Is that still an accurate statement? Well, thanks, Constantine, for the question. And I think as you heard me say to Tara earlier, again, we've seen this done before with other platforms. Out of an abundance of caution, um, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, and the Navy are standing down um, their their Osprey fleet. Um, I would direct you to the services to speak to of when they're going to be um, back up in the air. But as you can understand, there will always be an inherent risk in military aviation. And to mitigate that risk, we will continue to maintain the high uh, level of operational standardization uh, for all of our pilots and for all of the crew. Um, as you probably know, the Osprey is one of the premier assault aviation systems that we have. It is versatile, its speed um, and its uh, vertical lift capabilities are not met by any other platform existing in fixed or rotary wing platforms. And so it's an incredibly useful um, platform for all of our services to use. Again, out of an abundance of caution, there has been a stand down and I would direct you to the services uh, for when um, those will be back up in the air. All right, I will take one more from the phone and then I'll come back in the room. Uh, Chris Gordon. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. Uh, Senator Warren expressed concern uh, during a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing uh, yesterday about too many service members uh, are receiving lasting injuries or losing their lives due to accidents. Does the Pentagon share that view? Um, and what can be done to make training safer broadly? Does the part does the department need to review training accidents in whatever form, aviation or other? Well, thanks, Chris, for the question. Well, as you can see, I mean, the Air Force is doing an investigation right now into the mishap uh, that happened off the coast of Japan. Safety, security of our personnel, whether it be our in our Air Force, our Army, our Navy, our Marine Corps, uh, we take that very seriously. That's something that the secretary um, I know is a priority for him. And so we are evaluating any time that there is a mishap um, and there's an investigation, taking the lessons learned from that and applying it and um, making sure that uh, safety protocols and procedures are, are followed and enhanced if need be. All right, I'm gonna come back in the room. Tom. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, quick, two questions. One, on the Osprey, uh, do the services have the ability to do a stand on independently or does it have to be service wide? It, they can do it independently. Yeah. So, thanks. And the second question, unrelated to Osprey, uh, President of, of Guyana yesterday said that he's requesting 
U.S. military, possible U.S. military support uh, because of uh, Venezuela's referendum and the oil fields. This is not getting ahead of a decision, but this is just a clarification. Would such a request stay at Southcom or would it have to come to the Pentagon? How does that work? Well, of course, any decision, whether it's requesting military support, of course, would originate at the COCOM and then, of course, flow up through OSD. Thank yeah, you. Great. Fadi. Thank you, Sabrina. I want to go back to uh, Idris' question. So, sure. so this is the, you said you saw the report, I guess you're talking about the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty targeting um, Reuters photographer, my late, late friend, Issam Abdullah, and six other journalists, including Al Jazeera and AFP. This incident happened in Lebanon. It didn't happen in Gaza, where Hamas exists. Um, according to the, the reports, it was deliberate, and it amounts to a war crime. In addition to these discussions, does the secretary support accountability when it comes to the killing of Hassan Abdullah and the targeting of these journalists? Well, first, Fadi, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that you knew this journalist. And of course, our, our thoughts on behalf of the department are with you and, of course, the family. Um, Look, we are in constant communication, near daily communication, um, with our with the Israeli counter, uh, sorry, with the secretary's Israeli counterparts, and also here um, from senior levels engaging with the Israeli government. Um, you've seen all types um, from you know, the vice president's office. Uh, her national security advisor was just in the region as well, engaging with it, their his Israeli counterparts um, to discuss what is happening within Gaza and around Israel. We do not want to see this conflict spread out into a wider regional conflict. Um, as you know, we've sent and surged assets into the region to um, bolster our deterrence and send a message that we do not want to see this conflict widen. Um, and that also means uh, any conflict or clashes along the northern border. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The targeting of innocent civilians is something that we take very seriously. Um, and so we are in all of our conversations with the Israeli government, um, urging that they always um, take into account innocent civilians as they are conducting their operations against a terrorist organization that is Hamas. Okay, and on a, thank you. On a separate yeah. issue, uh, Israeli forces announced yesterday that they um, have received so far uh, almost 10,000 tons of uh, equipment and ammunition and almost 200 uh, air shipment. Mm -hmm. uh, are you able to say whether all of that came from the U.S. or what how the proportion of U.S. Uh, aid uh, as part of what, it, what, is, what was announced? I can't say for certain what part is uh, U.S. support. Um, we've been very clear that we're going to continue to support Israel with security assistance um, through FMS and FMF. Um, and uh, as long as you know, they need that support to conduct their operations against Hamas. Um, but in terms of the announcement that the Israeli government made, I can't tell you what specifically in that package that was delivered was U.S. military assistance. All I can tell you is that we are continuing to support Israel. Um, I, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Sure. For the future, this is not a question. Yeah. Will you be able to uh, compile the amount of assistance that's been provided, whether in yeah. a dollar term or, I don't know, weight or whatever? Yeah, that's some, I mean, that's something that I know you've asked about. That's something that we're working through. Uh, the difference and what makes it difficult is that the way we provide security assistance, let's say, to Ukraine is through coming off of our stock shelves, and um, it's through the Presidential Drawdown Authority, which is different from the funding mechanisms such as uh, FMS and FMF. We are working on it. Um, it's not that I've forgotten. I certainly haven't. Um, as you know, we've said that we're providing just broad strokes, uh, Israel with uh, ammunition, precision-guided uh, munitions, and then air defense, of course, as well. Nancy, yeah. Thanks. Um, I just want to start by reiterating Fadi's point. The war is two months today, and I think this is um, information we've been asking for for a few weeks. And yeah. given that at least part of it is paid for by tax dollars, I just want to reiterate how um, much we'd like to see that information as soon as possible. Um, I had a question about the Biden administration's announcement earlier this week, kind of issuing a dire warning that if um, Congress does not pass funding for Ukraine by the end of the year, it could affect um, resourcing for that war. Some Republicans are saying that it, the situation is not as urgent as the administration has presented it because there's at least a billion in funds. And given the pace of um, funding or um, 
weapons that have been provided so far that that money can stretch out for a bit of time. I wanted to know if you could give me a Pentagon assessment in terms of um, when funds could run out and, and how urgently this funding needs to be provided um, for Ukraine. Do, is there a point where the Pentagon feels without that funding in the next weeks um, it threatens the war itself? Sure. So I think the assertion was that that Ukraine doesn't need this funding and that they could manage with what we have left. Is that what you were the, summarizing? The U.S. has enough funding. There's still enough remaining funding that it could last for, it could be stretched out for a few more months, that it's not as urgent as the president um, presented yesterday. He yeah. He said it needed to be before the holidays. So right. I would, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Uh, I, would, I would strongly push back against that assertion. Um, the biggest problem that we are running up against is we don't have enough money to backfill our own stocks, which means we don't have enough to continue to supply Ukraine with what it needs because it is our weapons, our capabilities, our systems being pulled off our shelves and being shipped over to Ukraine. And so if we can't backfill, that's going to also impact our own readiness, which means that's going to impact what we can provide Ukraine. And so I, I would really push back on that assertion. And, you know, till till very recently we've enjoyed bipartisan support from congress um and that security assistance has been critical in providing ukraine what it needs on the battlefield and i i mean i would just remind you that um everyone thought that putin would take kiev in three days and the ukrainians have done an incredible job of not only defending kiev but then there were other battles that they were continue to push uh, the Russians back, continue to push them into um, the east and into the south, um, they are making very good use of our capabilities, and not just ours, allies and partners as well, providing them with the weapon systems that they need. And so um, you've heard the president say, you've heard the secretary say it, we're in it with Ukraine for the long haul. It's not just about making sure Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself on the battlefield. It's about making sure that Russia also gets the message that it cannot expand into other countries, un uh, into other sovereign countries, because that's exactly what Vladimir Putin wants. And, um, you know, you've seen some support from uh, both sides of the aisle in Congress. I think there's a small majority that oppose sending more funding to, for Ukraine. Um, we're working through that. Uh, we believe that the urgent supplemental request that we submitted to Congress is the right thing for Congress to to pass, and um, we're hopeful that it gets done. And one last topic. Sure. Um, can we get um, some sense of the number of sorties that the Ike and Ford uh, strike groups have conducted? Just, um, I think <coughs> we haven't had any real visibility in sort of how busy they've been as they have been in the Mediterranean. I'd love, if possible, some data on that. Yeah, we can take that. Yeah, no problem. Yes, over here. Thank you. Uh, comparing to the last couple of weeks, uh, there are very few attacks on international force and your force in Iraq. So do you believe it is because of your response to the previous attacks? And if I may add this, do you believe the Iraqi government can protect your forces that are in Iraq at the invitation of the government of Iraq? Well, just as you said, we're, at, we're in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. Uh, they've been one of our partners in the region and within Iraq in protecting our forces. And of course, the mission, the reason why, we're, why we are in Iraq is to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. So that the um, Iraqi military has been a partner in that effort. Um, look, in terms of the attacks on our forces, I think it's important to remember that uh, it's good that we have not seen attacks on our forces in the last 24 hours. We would like to see that continue. Um, I can't speak to whether that will be the case. I can't predict the future. Um, but I, I would re remind you that when we have decided to respond, it has been deliberate. It has been effective. It has Our strikes have been able to um, destroy weapons facilities, uh, command and control node, um, storage facilities that these IRGC-backed groups use. So I think it's important that while we did see a spate of attacks against our forces, they were largely not successful with minor damage to infrastructure. Um, and so, of course, we'll always respond back at a time and place of our choosing, but I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions on Osprey. Is this the first time for U.S. military to stop flying all Osprey variants at the same time? My second question, can you give us a sense of rough time, time frame of how long the uh, stand down will 
Thus, is it likely to be a matter of weeks and months rather than days? I'd refer you to the services to speak to how long this stand down, this stand down will last. Um, in terms of if this has been the first stand down, this, this is not. We've done this with other platforms. We've done it with the Osprey before. Um, but I'd let the services speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, and then I'll come in the back. Thank you. Uh, it's Osprey again. Sure. Uh, why did it take a uh, week to, you know, uh, reach the decision to uh, stand down? Well, again, we con started conducting the investigation as soon as the November 29th mishap happened. As the investigation um, was being conducted, the Air Force felt the need to issue that stand down. But for more information, I would direct you to the Air Force to speak to that. One more spray. Um, uh, that, what, what is the uh, potential material failure that was indicated in the preliminary investigation? Uh, could you give us a kind of more specific or clarification? I unfortunately don't have more information. I would direct you to the Air Force to speak to that. Again, this is an ongoing investigation, so I certainly wouldn't want to get ahead of that at this time. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. And then I'll come um, uh, as you mentioned at the opening uh, when you came, um, that uh, there's a call between Secretary Austin and his uh, Saudi counterpart, mm -hmm. and they were talking about the Houthis. So today, uh, the NSC coordinator, John Kirby, he said, We are not in an armed conflict with the Houthis. So, does the DOD share uh, with uh, Mr. Kirby this view? You are not in a war with the Houthis, and um, how so, though, you can prevent this conflict from widening and escalating. Yeah, absolutely. We share that view. We're not in an, an armed conflict with the Houthis. We have seen um, drones and missiles shot from Houthi-controlled areas within Yemen, um, not necessarily targeting our ships, uh, but of course targeting most likely commercial vessels that are transiting through the Red Sea. Um, and so part of, part of why we are in the region is to bolster our deterrence, but to also ensure the free passageway of commercial ships um, that are transiting through one of the most vital uh, waterways in the world. Um, and so, yeah, no, I completely agree with what um, Mr. Kirby said earlier today. We don't see conflict. Uh, we don't want to see this widen out to a regional war um, or into the larger region. And that's why you've seen the secretary make the decisions he did to send two carrier strike groups, one in the Eastern Med and then one, of course, in the CENTCOM area of responsibility to deter, to send the message of deterrence, to send a message to Iran and its proxies who would want to inflict, whether it's damage or harm to U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria or disrupt commercial um, uh, commerce in the Red Sea and in the region. Um, so that's that was a very deliberate um, decision by the secretary. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So just to circle back on Ukraine, um, the Ukrainians admitted that the counteroffensive has failed. Um, do you agree with that assessment and do you believe the war is a stalemate? And then. Um, how do you think the Ukrainians can break out of that? Do, does like more money and weapons help, or do you think they need a new strategy? I think your summary is a bit um, short. I don't think that they would say it's failed. Uh, we have seen them make progress in the counteroffensive. It might not be the gains that they want to be making every single day, but there there is incremental progress. I think that's important to remember. Um, I'd let the Ukrainians speak to uh, their own operations and, and how they can change um, what they need to do for the next phase of the war, which is entering into winter. Um, we have provided them the training, the equipment, the support that they need to be successful. And we feel very confident that they will be successful. And part of that is also invigorating their defense industrial base, which is why you saw the secretary speak at Commerce just uh, yesterday about the need for industry to partner with Ukraine so they can have a robust defense industrial base as they can as this war continues. Um, but I would let the Ukrainians really speak to their own operations and, and characterize what they see as success on the battlefield. Do you agree the, the war is a stalemate right now? I would let the Ukrainians speak to their own operations. Again, we feel confident that they have what it need, what they they have what they need to be successful on the battlefield. Great. I saw a question over here, and then I'll wrap it up. I have uh, two questions in the Middle East. Sure. Uh, the first is the U.S. sanctioned 13 individuals and entities that are funding the Houthis in Yemen. Do you believe that will um, slow down the amount of attacks that we're seeing in the Red Sea in that region over the coming weeks, or is that something that'll be more long term in slowing them down? And then secondly, what is the Pentagon's assessment? 
of uh, Israel's campaign to eliminate Hamas in Gaza. Um, so in terms of the, I think you're referring to sanctions that were issued by the, the Department of, our, of Treasury. I would direct you to them um, to speak more to the sanctions that were placed on those 13 individuals. Look, when you're hitting a financial network that has obvious effects, um, I can't predict that that slows down or stops any attacks. We can only continue to send the message that um, we do not want to see this war um, or a, a war widen into a regional conflict. And we will continue to respond should our commanders of our ships feel the need to in self-defense. And um, I'm sorry, your second question. It's the current assessment of <laughs> Israel's campaign to eliminate Hamas in Gaza. Oh, sorry. Um, look, I'd let Israel speak to that. Uh, we continue to engage with the Israelis on um, their targeting of a terrorist organization in Gaza. Um, we are talking to them. The secretary is talking to Minister Gallant on an almost daily basis, still getting updates, um, but also voicing um, support and concern uh, where he needs to. Did I see one more question? No. Yes, one in the back, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you. Ariel Montazos from Televisa. So. Director Ray from the FBI said a few days ago in a hearing uh, on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate mm -hmm. that the, the United States, uh, especially the FBI, is seeing alerts, terrorist alerts, mm -hmm. uh, that are unprecedented. And he even compared them or accepted the comparison to what the United States was seeing before 9-11. Um, do you coincide with that? Are you are you also worried or are you concerned about an unprecedented level of uh, terrorist threats, not only inside the United States, but also to United States interests abroad? I, I would let uh, the Department of Justice really speak to that and the Department of Homeland Security speak to the level of terrorist threats within the United States. That's not something this building can really speak to. Um, of course, we always monitor uh, threats around the world, threats to our uh, partners and allies, and, and threats to our interests abroad. Um, that's something that we're going to continue to do, but I don't have anything to announce or read out in terms of um, anything that we've observed that would change our behavior. All right. Thank you very much.